Hi, this is the Portland Media Center Civic IQ Project. I'm Greg Kessich, and I'm here with George Rowe as part of our conversations around the mayoral election of 2023. Um, unlike the other people who we've interviewed in part of this project, um, George's name is not on the ballot, but uh, he is uh, a candidate for mayor using the write-in system. And he is uh, one of the most uh, dedicated and, and critical followers of city government and um, somebody who uh, we thought would be worth talking to. So thanks for coming in, George. Well, thanks for having me. I definitely, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, enjoy my commitment, uh, my civic commitment, but a lot of people obviously <laughs> don't enjoy it uh, or wish I would stop. So this escalation is maybe, uh, you know, uh, good and bad for some people. So quickly, uh, you tell people what your status is as a candidate. Well, I um, uh, had a busy summer like most people. I, um, I have an 88-year-old mom who is, uh, had a couple of health hiccups uh, in July and August. And so uh, I was a little distracted, to be quite honest, on the mayoral race. But I was looking, as most people were, to see who would, you know, jump into the race. And uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, the homelessness situation uh, has been deteriorating in the city. Uh, you know, basically, it's been a long, hot summer, even though it's also been a long, wet and kind of somewhat meteorologically speaking, cool summer. But um, I ultimately was dissatisfied that we didn't get more uh, candidates uh, from different you know, sectors. And uh, after Labor Day, uh, things in my neighborhood had continued to be... And what neighborhood is that? So I live just a couple blocks down the street here on the Bayside side of Congress Street. Um, I consider myself basically a central downtown Portlander, but geographically, you know, my neighborhood, you know, has been sort of walled off as this West Bayside or Bayside neighborhood. If you go two blocks that way, you're still part of downtown, you're still, you know, part of the old port, and uh, you're not, and you're still considered part of Portland downtown, but you go two blocks that way, somehow you're like in a different neighborhood, which, you know, is sort of absurd. But, uh, you know, my wife and I, eight years ago, came to, to Maine from, uh, we were living in Los Angeles at the time, but I grew up in Southern New Hampshire, so it was kind of like coming back to the Northeast. But we chose downtown Portland because it really appealed to us, you know, like so many people, it had, um, you know, the vestiges of the 19th century city, but also, you know, it felt very modern and contemporary and there was a lot of activity and energy. And so we uh, jumped into that. And, uh, you know, the difficulty, though, is Portland is, you know, loves its history. It loves its character. It loves, you know, what uh, it's been able to preserve. But there's also real, you know, hesitancy to changing anything. Sure. And that has kind of, I think, paralyzed the city for decades. I mean, I think... Let's address the, uh, the your candidacy. Sure. Yeah. First. So you're a write-in candidate. What does that mean? So I'm a write-in. So, uh, so under state law, uh, 60 days before an election is the deadline for someone to declare themselves a write-in candidate. And that effectively means just basically uh, going to the city clerk's office and signing a form. But um, as a result of that... Um, and I did it on the last, the, the, literally the, the deadline day. Um, I did that partly because um, the just a few days before the city council had had their first September meeting, um, and they also had had the encampment um, uh, clearing out of four, the Four River Parkway. And the on the eve of that, the day before, the three members of the city's Health and Human Services Committee, uh, Tori Pelletier, uh, Anna Trevorrow, and um, uh, the chair of that, uh, April Fournier, had sent a letter to the city manager, the three of them, asking for the city manager to postpone that. And, you know, there was some merit in what they were asking the city manager to do. You know, is this the right thing? Is this the right time? But they did it literally with no time no real heads up. And the backdrop of that was that that committee has not had not even, they had taken August completely off. They had not even really discussed these issues in depth uh, during uh, their June and July meetings. And so they were basically asking for an extraordinary change without having done their homework, without having done, you know, built the ground for them to be able to take that position and expect somebody else, i.e. the city manager, to take them seriously and, and to do that 
that extraordinary change because that deadline, as you probably know, the Four River uh, Parkway, uh, you know, trail uh, cleanout, whatever sweep, um, that had been announced months before that deadline. And so, if you were going to be, everyone was going to be working towards that deadline, whether it's social workers, whether it's police and parks, but also the neighborhood around it had been given this notice that we would get some relief to make that switch kind of on the 11th hour, I mean, you have to have a really, you have to really prepare for that, right? And they didn't do that. Yeah, and so sure. it wasn't successful. But I'm not sure why that um, uh, results in an extraordinary uh, mayoral race. Well, because, you know, <clears throat> there is frustration. I mean, I think you uh, know that I've been participating in, in civic affairs, uh, mostly public comment for uh, most of the eight years that I've lived here and uh, beginning mostly with the India Street clinic closing. That was sort of one of the big moments when I sort of came onto the scene and started getting really publicly involved, like speaking up. Yeah. And so, you know, these, I mean, it's been a long eight years, right? Um, and a lot of people are like, why do you keep doing it? You know, what, what are you trying to achieve? And I, you know, what I want to, I've always told people is that, you know, we get the government that we deserve. If we are not paying attention, if we are not keeping a close watch, if we are not participating, then we really don't, and that can be, I mean, fundamentally it's about voting, right? That's the baseline participation. And for people who own property, maybe paying your paper property taxes on time, but there's a lot of ways to participate and get engaged. But if you're not following city business and you're upset with city business or you're dissatisfied with city business, you ultimately may might have your own self to blame. I, it's like, you know, you can't uh, expect good things when you're not even paying attention. Mm -hmm. And so I've kept that going. But, you know, there's definitely uh, diminishing returns, right? I mean, I'm a known quantity at City Hall. I speak up. Everyone takes notice when I speak up because they usually, uh, you know, think that I have a lot to offer. But they know that after my three minutes are up, I have to sit back down and I'm not really a threat to them, right? I'm not usually, I'm not, I haven't built a big coalition. I haven't tried to create a nonprofit or, you know, a, a, some kind of a media presence online or something to, to follow city business. I've kept it fairly restricted, but at some point I need to, uh, as I said, when I announced it at the city council meeting um, the other day, you have to kind of put up or shut up, right? At some point. And so to me, it was, seeing our city yet again fumbling on the issue of homelessness, which has been a specter for my wife and I all the eight years that we've lived here. Um, we lived in Los Angeles and we saw the acres of tents on sidewalks in Los Angeles, uh, the Skid Row neighborhood, and in other parts of the city, Venice Beach and other parts. And we that's what we were leaving. And when I came here, I said, hey, we're gonna have that soon. If we continue with Gentrification, which has a lot of positive aspects, if we keep up with gentrification, if we keep refusing to uh, adjust our land use regime so that we can actually have capacity for growth and have capacity for the people who are here today to continue to exist on some basis that they don't have to always be competing with the person with the money from out from away. If we're not fixing those things, we are going to have tents on the sidewalk. We are going to have tents in our parks. And this is the year when it finally all came to a crescendo, crescendo because of, you know, somewhat to do with our judicial system, right? Let me, let me add one more run at this. Um, isn't the role of mayor uh, building coalitions and, um, and the, the, the process of running for mayor uh, demonstrating that you have the ability to bring people together, either to raise money or even just to get your signatures uh, signed. Um, and by circumventing that process, um, aren't you failing to show people that you have the ability to do uh, what the job requires? Well, and I jumped in here because I think most people know that I haven't chosen camps. I haven't chosen camps over the years. I have been sympathetic to a lot of policy ideas on both sides of the aisle. I mean, you know, I was not a big fan of John Jennings and John Jennings' style and his approach. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of things that he did. The former city manager, the former city manager who had uh, departed under a big cloud here, yeah. uh, went to Clearwater, Florida and lasted about a year before that uh, 
body, uh, the, the, the yeah. city uh, manager or the city council of Clearwater uh, ousted him because basically I think they were concerned when they hired him that he might turn into uh, what people experience in Portland in terms of him trying to control overly control things and not share and be a collaborator. And as soon as he started exhibiting those those traits, I think that they said, okay, well, this is what we were worried about. And so we're not we're not gonna spend years trying to work with this. We're just gonna we're gonna change ships. And so uh, but Portland City Council over the years did give him a long leash and uh, he accomplished some things. I didn't agree with all of it, but the point is is that um, you know, Ethan Strimling was somebody that I also thought that he was sincere and earnest and had a lot of uh, things that he was trying to accomplish that were legitimate. And so both sides know that with George Rowe, you get you get hard questions. Uh, you know, do you recognize that there are competing interests about what you're trying to achieve? Um, I mean, a good example is you Mark. Think the mayor is primarily a hard question answer. Esther. I think that uh, fundamentally, that is the only real power um, that the mayor has is to ask questions. And that's why I think I'm mean, low down here. What are you trying to do? I, th yeah. I think that, um, you know, and this is why I think I'm uniquely qualified, because effectively I've been following closely city business. I read uh, in my spare time just about every agenda of just about every body that the city makes available to the public. And what that does is I kind of see the landscape. I see the full landscape, the full constellation of all of these committees and all of these uh, bodies. A lot of them are advisory, but a lot of them have tremendous power. I mean, the Land Bank Commission is a good example in that colors our land use. I mean, we have literally hundreds of people in our public parks, but we also have this little body, the Land Bank Commission, that has been um, over the course of uh, Mayor Snyder's term, has been able to, uh, uh, bring in literally dozens of acres of land across the city into our effectively our open space and park system. And in each of those cases, there were opportunities for housing to be included as part of those land transactions. And this goes way back, you know, where I mean, basically for decades we've been doing this. And we always, because it's Maine and it's very hard for someone to object to green space and to object to conservation and object to, you know, making more parks, yeah. we don't balance that. And what the consequence of that is, if that's our land use and we, Com completely privilege open space and green space and conservation, and we don't do the hard work of making a place for more housing, then ultimately we have the crisis that we have, which is lots and lots of indigent people, lots and lots of people that our capitalist capitalistic system has basically ejected, right? These are basically our policy failures. And we don't have a, a robust enough safety net in our country for those, po for those folks to be able to find their way again. Um, I actually uh, hate the way that we term a lot of, of our emergency shelters and our transition, they call it transitional housing, where you know people are maybe able to spend you know six to nine months trying to get back on their feet. I would like to rebrand it as stand-up housing. Because I think a lot of these folks have been knocked down. They've been knocked down by life. They've been knocked down by sometimes family, friends, drug addiction, obviously, mental health. But the system itself is pretty brutal, right? Yeah. I think most of us who have managed to get a middle class, uh, you know, um, hold on things or, or, you know, even more privileged than that, you know, we know how fragile it is, right? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, a lot of people are literally one paycheck away from not necessarily destitution, but homelessness or, you know, extreme precarious existence in our system. And that's the system. And I think we forget when we're successful, and I've been lucky enough to be successful in my life, that we forget that there are a lot of people who just, the system is going to create unsuccessful citizens. And it's our obligation to try and get those folks back you can't on. Can't have the big winners without somebody losing, right? Well, true, exactly. Sure. Well, true, but but I think we also want to be um, have a system that is not, um, you know, this is not Calcutta, right? right? This is not. We are. Tr we have a very wealthy society, and we have a society where if we work together, we can 
we can not just have a safety net, but we can have, you know, people who recognize they maybe either made bad choices or did not uh, get the full advantages that they needed to succeed. And they, we will give them opportunities to go back and maybe get back into the system and hopefully either adjust their expectations, which sometimes is the case, right? You know, lots of people when you're young, you know, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm president and, you know, mm -hmm. senator, astronaut. Mm -hmm. And what do you end up becoming? You become a plumber. And, yeah. you know, and it's like, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. But so, you know, so uh, I've been here for a while and uh, I've never seen uh, the, the unhoused population uh, the way it is now. Um, uh, not just the tents, but you go up and down Congress Street at night and there are people sleeping in doorways. Um, uh, just it's it's clearly it seems to be connected with uh, COVID. Uh, that seems to be about the time when, when things really exploded. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, it's with us. And. Uh, you've talked a little bit around this, but but what's your sense of what, what are we experiencing here? And uh, as a city, what can we do about it? Well, again, you know, back to the mayor. I mean, the mayor's job uh, fundamentally, and if you read the city charter, the mayor uh, has no power to order anyone around, mm -hmm. except in one place. The city charter is very clear that the mayor shall direct, and that's literally a quote, shall direct, it's about the clearest command in the city charter shall direct the city manager in the preparation of agenda. And so basically that allows the, the mayor to control what comes before the city council. And it's a delicate dance because there's another part of the city charter that says that the day-to-day -day administration of the city is under the city manager's rubric. So we have to reconcile those two things because they often can be in conflict, right? If I want to uh, put some backup material into the record for our city council meeting on agenda topic X, and the city manager says, well, I don't have a staff member available right now to help you do that. Well, that's, a, that's an issue, right? Like, okay, so his day-to-day -day administration is blocking me from directing the city manager. And of course, you know, Danielle West is, is you know, mm -hmm. uh, a woman, and, and I'm glad that we have a woman in that position now. But, um, you know, whoever the city manager is, that individual has the opportunity to interfere with that city charter mandate for the mayor to have that power over the agenda. And the rest of the city council also has power because, you know, we have council rules that are allowing the city council members, if they have a supermajority, to place things on the agenda as well. But the focus has to be on what is before the city council. You know, we typically meet two, we would meet two times a month, and sometimes there's special meetings and things like that. But, you know, you really need to get into the weeds of what, how are we spending our time? And I think for sure, and this is again one reason I decided to run, the last couple of years, I don't think we've used our time well uh, for those limited opportunities. But one of the most important things, and I'm sure in your professional life uh, before your retirement, you know, most of us have game days of some kind, right? Yeah. Where, you know, in for the city council, it's, it's the city council meeting. But a game day is where you perform at a high level and do your job. But you have, if you're doing that job well, you have all this back end prep to get to game day, right? And so, you know, it's almost like an iceberg. Like the the when the Patriots march out onto the field on a Sunday, that's 20% of their life. But 80% is practice, is watching tape, is going over, you know, game plans. It's all that back end work. You do that back end work, and of course, you know, Bill Belichick, that was his, sure. you know, in the last couple of decades, he supposedly prepared his team better than anybody else to make game day as impactful as possible. And that is, I know that if we do that 80% well, that we won't look like a city council that's flailing. We won't look like a city council that doesn't know how to work with city staff and parry and thrust with city staff because the city staff often has a different agenda than the city council. And that's fair because they see things, they have a different, you know, sometimes different prerogatives, different view, different mandates. And so they are not always gonna see eye to eye. But how we deal with that is by doing 
the hard work to sort of burrow in and basically be prepared to stand toe to toe with city staff. So you, your, your critique seems to be, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, um, that the, uh, the elected officials are not doing their homework and not, uh, and that's, um, of the flaw in our response to homelessness and other issues, but particularly we're talking about homelessness. Exactly. I mean, I I am very I am very excited that we have such a diverse city council today. Um, I mean, it's it's extraordinary. We have youth, we have energy, we have people that really want things to be better in our city, and they mean very very well. But the mayor is the only full time position, right, of the right. nine yeah. members. And if you add up, if you do the numbers, the mayor the mayor gets paid a salary. I've actually been trying to find out what the latest salary is, and uh, the city hall hasn't been very forthcoming about that, even though the city charter requires them to state that at the beginning of the nomination it's, it's process. The calculation based on uh, the area of meeting. Well, exactly. They bury it in the budget, and I think they're getting around the the, the city charter requirement by saying, well, we, we folded it into the budget that uh, we passed for the next fiscal year. But the fact is the city charter requires them to sort of make that a little bit more open and and focused and and transparent but the the key issue is the city council members each get a stipend too but that stipend is i think probably somewhere in the range of six to seven thousand dollars might have creeped up to eight because i think they get a little escalator too for for cost of living but if you add up the other eight members you add up all of their stipends, it's yeah. still less than what the mayor makes uh -huh. because the mayor's salary has been escalating a, a lot. Well, actually, it's a full-time job. I mean, yeah. so, so a part-time council, the part-time, the eight part-time members, they basically need that full-time mayor to be working very, very hard for them and to be doing, to running around Monday through Friday and sometimes maybe beyond that, doing the work that they can't possibly do well in their positions, being part-timers, having other parts of their life, other livelihoods that they have to family, that they have to address. But the thing that's key is if you've watched Ethan Strimling sort of uh, be undercut, frankly, by the Jennings administration, and you've watched to some extent even uh, that's applied to, I think, Kate Snyder too, but certainly the other members of the city council, they often are in charge of city council committees. But then these city council committees are basically sort of very uh, fragile. They're not really able to accomplish very much because they ask staff for things and the staff does one of two things. They either come up with elaborate excuses why that would just take so much time and they don't have that time or they need to get an instruction from the full council before they go and, and do that. But they also a lot of times are in the position of basically saying, well, that's not our job, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so you have to be creative. If you're the mayor, you have to figure out a way. I trust our department heads. There's no department head in the city right now that I think is unqualified or, you know, in a, un, incapable of doing their jobs. But they have to believe that the city council is a meaningful partner and a partner that they have to heed on a regular basis. And so my job, one of the things that I would do, I would do two things. And I, first of all, I would like to uh, make 20, because I think our mayor's salary is a little bit on the high side for, for the job, but I would take 20% of my salary and put that into a mayoral special projects fund so that the city council and I would have a, a, a little kitty that we would be able to basically hold a reception, for example, or convene a summit in one of the city hall rooms. You can rent city hall for a wedding, but the city council Right now, if they wanted to do any kind of event, they're at the mercy of the city staff for all of the logistics. And that is troublesome, right? Because, you know, if if the city staff and the city manager is on the same page with the city council for an, an initiative, then it's easy. But if they want to hem and haw, they can find ways to, you know, prevent that from happening in a timely fashion. So that 20... So, I want to go back a little bit, because uh, you talked about the streamlining years and... Um, I think maybe my uh, observation was a little different than yours. Um, yes, he was in conflict with the, the city manager in a way that I don't think anybody anticipated was possible uh, when they wrote the charter. He also had, uh, from what I could see, a lack of support on the council. And um, uh, he was kind of going solo one-on-one -on -one with somebody who was by statute, much more powerful than him. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this gets back to the, um, 
uh, original question about you know whether a mayor is an organizer, you sort of described maybe something like a football coach. Sure. But um, uh, why should other council members uh, side with an elected mayor who uh, doesn't have the ability to fix a pothole in their district or doesn't have um, uh, control of you know the the mechanisms of city government mm-hmm. the way the manager does? If there's a you know, how, how do you get them on side? Well, it's it's difficult and it's it's a daily battle, but partly it's understanding exactly what the city does. Right. And again, I think that um, one of Ethan's problems is I didn't think that Ethan actually had a, a, a good command of what the city does on a daily basis. I think he needed to do a lot more listening and a lot mm-hmm. more um, homework. And if he had done that, uh, he might have chosen his battles better. Um, but you know, we, I think I was not here for the, the Brennan era, but, you know, I did arrive when Ethan was being um, uh, elected in 2015. And it was pretty obvious that the, the city council majority at that time was, had grown tired of Mayor Brennan, you know, sort yes. of uh, not always engaged. Yeah, different him. set of conflicts, but yes, it was yeah. the same kind of thing. So the, so Ethan, who had been uh, tried to be mayor in 2011, you know, he that was unsuccessful, but they brought Ethan back because he was kind of, in their view, kind of a fusion candidate. You know, he was going to bring everyone together. And yeah. but what the real goal there, and I think Ethan was sort of forgot why he was chosen and, and given a lot of the endorsements and support was that he was simply just not Mayor Brennan. And so, uh, and I think everyone, this is the short termism that I think affects a lot of communities, but Portland especially, is people just focus on the next step and the one, the next thing. And so Ethan was, he solved the problem of you don't have to worry about Mayor Brennan anymore, but no one had ever probably really gotten into the weeds with Ethan about what Ethan had had a mind to do. And so Ethan quickly established some independence and also, uh, the council changed. I mean, Ed Soslovic lost decisively in 2016, and Pius came on. Uh, Pius Ali came on as well, and those were both. Uh, uh, and, John Hank, yeah. Yeah, and well, John exactly. John Hank kind of fumbled. Yeah. Uh, he was going to go to the state legislature, and that didn't work out. Um, but he um, and that's that basically made him an ineffective candidate against Pius. But Brian Batson stood up. A young man who you know came out of literally nowhere. He had only been in Portland for a couple of years, but Ed Sosovic decided not to really run a campaign. He just assumed his incumbency and his long service in, in Portland politics was enough, and he lost. And so I think you see in 2016 everyone getting angry at City Hall with uh, the independence of Ethan Strimling, and then you had the next election. Ethan gets two potential allies, and so that's when the bells really went off. And at that point, it was all about, we have to crush Ethan. And Ethan, unfortunately, sort of stumbled. He had a very small window to be able to, you know, uh, not be isolated. And that window closed very quickly, and he was isolated, and it was a, a terrible slog after that, the rest of his, his, his tenure. But again, if you fast forward to Ethan's election, uh, re-election effort, Basically, again, the same dynamic. It was, we want a mayor that basically won't get in the way, won't get in the way of the staff, won't get in the way of really anything, and won't be ambitious, won't be, uh, you know, really creating any initiatives. And that's why, you know, we have Mayor Kate Snyder, is that she basically was, um, you know, a few people have described her, frankly, as a ghost mayor. She doesn't have a presence. She has been... um, basically a caretaker. And she uh, it's, she's had an extraordinarily rough ride. I mean, when you become uh, an elected official, you don't get to pick, you know, whether the Great Depression happens, <laughs> whether World War II breaks out, whether, you know, uh, a, a worldwide pandemic hits. So you kind of have to take what happens. And so what happened was she immediately, after a few months of a honeymoon period, things got really complicated. And to her credit, she probably recognized that ambition, um, and she had her own personal issues. I think her father passed away, I think, uh, during her term, which probably wasn't uh, easy and, and, and probably something that, that was, um, 
you know, made it harder for her to engage. You know, she said at the at library the other night, um, the, the, the charter gives a very prescribed role yeah. uh, for the mayor. And uh, she held up the charter and her council rules. Well, I mean, and, but I, I one time, uh, the mayor has these Zoom calls, these little sort of town halls. And I've been trying to attend them pretty regularly because I learn things, but they're not well attended. I don't think uh, most people even if they know about them, even bother with them because they're they're fairly modest affairs, usually like 45 minutes. But I asked her uh, earlier this year, I, I pointed out that provision in the city charter about the mayor shall direct yeah. the city manager. And she, she actually didn't understand that language. And she recollected that it didn't say what I said it said. And she basically, it revealed to me, I'm like, wow, this is, you know, her fourth year of her term. And she is not even really aware of this weapon, the only weapon that the mayor has. And that weapon has to be, it's like any weapon, you have to be very careful how you use it, right? I mean, obviously, um, if you don't, if, if you, if you uh, are willy nilly um, and you, you know, aren't careful with how you're wielding it, you will lose it. And so the city council, it's a partnership. I think that our city council is uh, been stymied. I think they've been neutered. Uh, they're on really key issues and homelessness is another good example. They're deaf, dumb, and blind, to be quite honest. And that is sometimes by design because it's convenient for city staff to have our city council not be able to project any sense of competence or uh, control over anything. They want them to be dependent on staff because staff, that makes them more amenable to do what staff wants them to do when they want them to do it. But we have to really push back on that. And the only way to do that is through soft power. The only way to do that is to be up on your details, read every agenda, know exactly what's going on in the city. And, you know, I, I, uh, I'm a bit of a paper tiger in my current just paying attention to what's going on in the city because I only get usually a couple minutes of public comment or, you know, a few emails here and there. I don't bother Badger staff because I know that there's, you know, over 68,000 people in Portland. And if everyone was emailing questions all the time, you know, it would be pretty overwhelming. And I don't have any expectation that somebody should be answering my email on a regular basis just because. But the point that you have to recognize is that, um, City staff pay attention to me now, and I. it's because they're like, he's going to put us in the hot seat. He's going to ask the question that no one else is asking. He's going to make us do our jobs, and he's going to have us, you know, the famous movie Stand and Deliver. There's a stand and deliver when George says something, but they also know I'm a paper tiger because I don't have power. I don't have authority. So when I sit back down, they're like, whew, that's over, and we can march on. But I've tried to get our city council to recognize like this little modeling of behavior is what you guys could be doing as a body of nine. And you could really, you could really, you could really make a difference because the city staff, if you wear them down, just like they've worn you down, they will, they will recognize that, okay, you are a, a partner that has to be reckoned with. And if we don't, if we aren't a partner to be reckoned with, the city council is on the sidelines. And eventually, I mean, I want our every city council member to be successful. I want you to feel like you're serving your constituents. I want to feel like your constituents believe that you have a handle on city business. And I want them to make them look good. Give me, give me a scenario. Um, uh, let's say we have a, a functioning uh, city council with a mayor who is uh, communicating with everybody and they keeping people prepared um, and uh, asking the tough questions of staff, how could the city be dealing with a problem like the homeless encampments? Sure. Uh, well, when, what, what, are, what, are, what could we be doing that we're not doing now? Well, we had a workshop about this. And one at one point during the, the Q&A with city officials, uh, one counselor asked, what is the intake process at the homeless services sh shelter? This is the middle of September of a homelessness crisis that the city has had ongoing for decades, and it's gotten worse, and it's, you know, it's, it's sort of been aggravated and amplified. But that, to me, is... That is exactly what I'm talking about. The, the city council should have had that information a long time ago. 
That should not have been, that should not have wasted our time in a workshop about encampment solutions and, and encampment, um, you know, progress. But we're dealing with basic information that still hasn't been put on the table after literally months and months of ferment. So to me, that encampment workshop was almost a waste of time because it was like basically like A, B, C, D when we should have already been doing calculus, right? And so it, it's hard to, for people on the outside to have faith. What the homelessness situation is going to take time. I mean, first of all, I mean, I think everybody acknowledges all five of the other candidates, but also everybody in this town knows that you can't take a decades long crisis of poor land use choices um, hyper gentrification, um, you know, those with the most get to kind of control the agenda and those with the least are basically out to fend for themselves. That's not going to change overnight. But there are things in my neighborhood. I mean, I've been attacked on my front porch by three young men in their 20s, um, who two of whom had been uh, uh, criminally trespassed from the Preble Street teen shelter. Um, I had to prosecute them because I wanted to make sure that there were consequences. But I also know that each of those three individuals had a story and the, our system failed them and they ended up on my front porch trying to intimidate me and almost seriously hurt me. So, you know, I'm as frustrated as anybody. I didn't want to be in that position, but I also want to basically say, this is my house and this is my neighborhood and I would like you to respect my neighborhood. That is, uh, how you know we need to basically i think people forget because we've created this encampment task force it sounds really impressive right but it's basically when you look underneath the hood it's basically the same small group of agencies and social workers that have been doing this work for years we're trying to be a little bit more deliberate a little bit more systematic but it's not really anything first of all that we should have been doing for years I mean, 2017 i wanted the uh, the city council to appoint a homeless czar, for lack of a better word. We love that, you know, from the 80s, 70s and 80s. So czars this and czars that was a, a lingo, but at the national level. But the point is, is that we needed someone whose was job... Before there was an ascendant Russia. Exa you know, exa exact, no, exactly. The, the, the Cold War is over, even though it's back again. But anyway, that the point being that um, we needed a coordinator who did nothing but try and help bring data and what people needed and what people were doing. Also in 2016, this is another like little factoid. One of the council goals was uh, thrown out to create five uh, housing first uh, developments. And this was just after the Houston Commons project was underway. It was in construction at that time. It hadn't, I don't think it had opened yet. But basically everyone was excited that the Housing First model had real potential. And if we could just find some small scale um, locations for these small, uh, you know, 20, 30 bed opportunities, we could manage these folks uh, and help them have the stand up opportunity that I was talking about earlier. But the city council got distracted. They they didn't follow that path. And they might have had some good reasons. Obviously, the Page Limit administration was probably not very amenable to that. And there was a lot of work in the legislature to do that. Some of that work has been done more recently. But the, the time for housing first to really move the needle in this city for new housing first opportunities, it's two, three, probably four years away before they open their doors. So that's 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 tragic, right? But you have to you know, you have to start somewhere. But what I want to make sure is that the goal setting uh, opportunity, which at the beginning of every council year, the city charter mandates a goal setting. And that's a great example of what I'm talking about. I've watched these goal setting workshops happen year after year after year. What happens is the city manager, whether it's Danielle West or, or um, as interim or permanent now, or John Jennings would sit basically in the corner and let the council sort of have these sort of vague, very high level discussions uh, about, you know, work on affordable housing, work on homelessness. Those aren't goals. Those are like high, big aspirations. But at the end of these things, the, ma the manager often would be like, well, I'm not sure we have time for this or have time for that. You know, they never had to come forward basically at the beginning of that goal setting workshop and lay out their agenda, 
what are what do you think because you're the guy or the gal who has all of the authority and administrative power here why are we trying to shoehorn in or having this sort of wide-ranging discussion about our goals when we have no idea how they're supposed to plug in to the roadmap that you have laid out and actually danielle west recently during one of the, the city meetings she she sort of offhandedly was like look we have a a, a, you know, we have a 30 day roadmap and a 60 day roadmap and a 90 day roadmap. And she just sort of went off and, and moved on to something else. But I'm like, how does the council think they're going to get anything done in the city if they don't have that same roadmap from the city manager in front of them? Well, they have to make choices. Has, uh, nobody ever has a goal. Um, I'm going to deal with a global pandemic. I'm going to deal with a worldwide protest movement on police violence. I'm yeah. going to deal with unprecedented anything, yeah. right? So you kind of have to work from where we are now. And I, I, but that's the leadership, right? Okay, so what's the leadership, how, what, how, what's the leadership role in dealing with the homeless situation that we have now, which as you said, is a result from decades of bad policy, mm -hmm. um, not just on the local level, on the, on the national level, um, uh, economic forces that are beyond the control of any, any uh, elected official in the city of Portland. Mm -hmm. What are we gonna do now? Sure. Well, you know, I mean, the most enormously complicated work that the city is doing is the recode process, right? Mm -hmm. That is this sprawling effort to sort of somehow re, um, you know, sort of reimagine all of our land use relationships across across the city. What that's turned into is basically a very tiny, small ball kind of changes. And that's all that I think the city staff feels that politically they can they can pull off. And because of that, there hasn't been much energy to move it forward. And that is a really frustrating thing because we are, um, you know, what we do today is going to establish everyone's expectations for the future. And zoning is incredibly um, sticky. It, once it's in place, people feel like it is like basically like a sacred constitution, even though it's just literally every other ordinance in the city is just like zoning. You can change it quickly if you wanted to. It doesn't, you don't even need the planning board. We can go around the planning board if we wanted to. We need the political willpower to do that. But if you have people who, um, you know, when you live on Munjoy Hill, yeah. Munjoy Hill has been walled off both with historic preservation and of course through just basic zoning for years. And this was traditionally the place that was uh, a, a very modest place for people to live. And there was a whole historical reasons for that, right. uh, including pollution. It stank to high heaven to live up there and nobody wanted to live there. And if you could avoid it, you, you did. Um, you know, the wind, every east end in every city in the world, the prevailing westerlies bring the noxious fumes to the east end. Yeah. And that was the case here, too. So, but on the... On, and, you know, that was a big foundry at the bottom of the hill. Exactly. And uh, lots of uh, rail tra At travel in and out. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, when you have a rail car, when you have, you know, a thousand rail cars a day with cattle uh, from uh, Canada... Right. And immigrants from Europe going to Canada. Yeah. yeah. So, so it was a disfavored neighborhood. Then it became hot after we built our sewage treatment plant, and then now it's hot real estate, hot the hottest real estate probably in Maine. And so, uh, not just because it doesn't smell bad, but also because uh, there's a lot of competition for that kind of life you can have there. Sure. A walkable neighborhood. Yeah. Um, uh, where you can ride around on a bike. Uh, you, there's public access to public transit. Yep. And the irony is that like this working class neighborhood has become a, um, uh, a, a upscale neighborhood because it, exactly. it's so desirable. It has all the attributes that if you... Another neighborhood exactly. that's where the wind... Yeah. Comes Beautiful views, access to some of our best uh, you know, waterfront uh, opportunities, amenities. And again, the, the architecture up there obviously is very, you know, it's, it's 19th century. It, it's, it's all over the place. Yeah. But though, but the thing is, is all development basically in that area has been stopped. In fact, in my eight years, there's probably been almost uh, a dozen lawsuits, project by project or referendums right. that have tried to stop literally everything from as modest as like a, like a six unit condo building. There was an affordable, the Murata Adams school site generated a lawsuit, even though what ended up 
being proposed for that site was the most unambitious. I mean, the only, they were like one step up from putting single family homes out there on a one and a half acre site um, that used to be a trolley barn um, at one time. And so my point is, going back to you know where we were, is Munjoy Hill has um, basically made it impossible to participate in creating the housing that we need. Right now, across the street from me, a four unit, uh, very modest two and a half story, 19th century era building, probably just a little bit more older than my 1850s house, um, it was emptied out a year ago. And there is an investor from the Boston area that is trying to convert it into condos. I don't know if it's financially it's going to be a success. I don't know who's going to end up living there. But basically, four households, uh, some of whom had lived there for over a decade, had to empty out. Why? Because somebody saw an opportunity. And the rent control, uh, rent stabilization rules gave those tenants all a little bit of power, a little bit of leverage. But it didn't keep them in that in that in that in the, under the, those roofs. So what happened is we now have a Boston investor who wants to create some higher end housing. I mean, they've literally had to probably spend hundreds of thousands of dollars because that house had not been invested in for decades. It was a mess. There's like rats running in and out of the basement. So no one's going to pay for rats running in and out of the basement. You know, um, so you have to fix it up. You have to make that investment. The only way to get that investment back you have to sell it to somebody who can afford to pay the price that, that gives you. So George, I'm hearing a lot of critique, but I'm not hearing any program. Uh, well, what, what is that we can do? Well, address, uh, you know, this it's, it's focus. It's focus. It's talking to each one of the counselors about their agendas, right? And what I would do is um, to, to avoid the isolation of the council. One of the things that I would suggest is, um, like I said earlier about the 20% of my salary I want to dedicate as a, as, a, as a fund to give us some room to maneuver and to generate some ideas and some opportunities for ourselves. But also I would ask each counselor to make me a, the, either the vice chair or the chair of, their, of the committee, of each committee. In each committee, what is basically the city council committees are where most of the work is done. You know, typically issues will come up through a city council committee before it goes on to the agenda. And this is supposed to help us generate these opportunities. But what happens is the same stonewalling at the council level happens at the committee level. So if, if the, but, but that typically happens because you have the city uh, councilors who are chairing these committees, they're one step removed from the mayor. And they're one step removed from, from that ability to control agendas and to get the flow of information from staff. If we could get uh, each of these committees, you know, working transparently across, you know, all of the business of, of, the, uh, of the council, we will be able to make better choices. Because if one committee wants to create an initiative or is being having an initiative imposed on them by city staff that's going to take a lot of time that should be balanced with all of these other committees that are doing work right we need to see the whole landscape at the same time literally every day because that's how life works right i mean a major newspaper doesn't let silos operate completely independent of the of the bigger uh, print operation right somebody has to bring it together that's what leadership and editors and you know department heads are supposed to do. But if we work together, we will not be isolated. I know for a fact that a lot of city councilors are extremely find their their chairing duties of their committees extremely unsatisfying because the staff is able to undercut anything that they wanted to do. And if you bring in, because you know about the open meeting laws. Mm -hmm. If three councilors are trying to sit down to talk city business, that's officially a public meeting. Right. It has to get noticed. It has to be, you know, there has to be witnesses. And so, but two councilors can sit down and work through stuff. And then one, each one of those can go off and have conversations with others. But if you have the mayor as either the vice chair or the chair of every committee, then they can work collaboratively with the other councilor who is either the chair or the vice chair. And those two people are in the loop and they make sure that the city staff and the city manager make sure that everyone stays in the loop. And so the isolation, so 
the system we have now is all of these city councilors are trying to create these little independent, I mean, it, it, I don't think they view it this way, but arguably little fiefdoms, right? They're trying to get, I'm the finance, you know, Mark Dyan, I'm the finance committee chair. And so he often is unable to uh, really assert himself other than through basically deferring to staff. And to me, I think that if the mayor knows what each committee is doing on a daily basis, that enables the part-time counselors to work together effectively, and they can leverage their time and kind of, you know, sort of uh, sally back and forth to what do we need to do on any particular, you know, we, we have a, a landscape ahead of us. How do we want to play that? How do we want to make choices that make sense. I mean, one initiative from the Health and Human Services Committee this past year was possibly thinking of ways to um, uh, make some advancement on reproductive rights. There's these pregn pregnancy crisis centers that a lot of right-wing conservatives who are anti-abortion have created across the country, including in the state of Maine. And I think there was an, uh, a desire to try and make sure that those uh, any of those institutions existing here in Portland have some parameters around which they operate. This is an incredibly worthwhile objective, but is it appropriate? for the city of Portland to be able to take that on? Is it appropriate for us to spend a lot of Health and Human Services committee time doing that? Could we have a forum uh, on a Saturday evening? Could we have experts who you know, maybe get a travel stipend from the mayoral special projects fund that I would like to set up, come in and visit and have a panel? Even the folks that run the pregnancy crisis centers they will give them an opportunity to give their point of view. But the issue I think that the counselors wanted to address was raise visibility about this issue, figure out what's going on in Portland, and also start to prepare the ground for whether the city can be in some way intervening in that to either make it better or to at least address whatever public policy concerns. To me, that is not something that is illegitimate to have attempted, but you have to factor it in into all the more important things that are going on. I don't know that it should have been a big focus of our Health and Human Services uh, time for that committee this past year. Could we have made sure that those committed city councilors who wanted to see progress being made on that issue, could we have found a way to make sure that they were fulfilling either if this was a campaign promise or if they had engaged with their coalitions that brought them to the city council, could we have figured out a way to get that visibility about this issue without having to soak up critical time that has literally taken us away from some of the homelessness issues? And I mean, we just had the Homeless Services Center open up in, in the, the end of the winter. We have no idea about how it's really functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. We haven't even seen the numbers of what we're spending on an operational basis. And yet right now, the proposal for next week that we're having a, a, another workshop from the city council is to basically have a, um, uh, you know, a proposal to expand the capacity of the homeless services center with its it's it's been an operation like barely like six months and we're already gonna you know increase dramatically its capacity but we have had no good examination about even what the first few months of operations look like and i i never was a big proponent of the mega shelter out there because i knew it was far enough away that if a lot of folks who had a choice didn't need to be there they would find a way to stay away from it because it's completely on the edge of everything, whether it's service providers, panhandling opportunities, you know, family and friends. It's just it's way out there. But most of the thing that I just was unhappy with was we spent over twenty five million dollars and there were a couple little line items. We have to kind of connect that we spent most of that money on the foundation. It was an incredibly expensive site to build on. I don't know if you ever went out there when it was being constructed, but for much of its construction, there was these giant, like three-story high piles of dirt because that entire area was basically landfill. It was not, that was not the original topography there. And to build it, Kevin Bunker and Chambro had to build these elaborate, like geotextile, like foundations just to make sure that the building didn't slide off. Yeah. like it did in Westbrook a, a year or two ago. Remember that big yeah. landslide? So anyway, my point is we spent an enormous amount of money to build a world-class 
foundation. Mm -hmm. That helps, that literally helps no one. And that makes no sense to me. And if you don't have a lot of money and every single conservative Portlander will talk about mm -hmm. how limited our resources are and the property taxes can't go up anymore. I agree with that, except you guys just wasted a lot of money on the most expensive foundation that Portland has built in probably, you know, decades. Why are we putting all the money underground when the people above the ground are what matter, right? So let's go back to the race. Because uh, I, I think uh, what I hear you saying is, uh, uh, the, you know, the, what you would bring to the job is a, a level of attention and uh, working with uh, the other counselors, get people uh, on, on side and able to take on these issues in an informed way. And it's probably a relief to hear that all five of the other candidates also say that they're going to be collaborative workers and they're going to get the council together and mm -hmm. work as a team. So why is it that none of the five uh, candidates who qualified for the ballot um, uh, will meet your requirement? What, what made you have to get into this race? Uh, well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, the camps kind of break down. I mean, for lack of a better word, you know, Ethan Strimling uh, was considered sort of the, the, the leader of maybe a, a progressive left block in the city. Um, you know, I don't think everyone subscribes to him being that le the leader of that block. But, you know, if you wanted to just broadly think of Team Strimling or, you know, sort of our progressive left, you know, I think uh, Andrew Zaro and Pius Ali, you know, sort of fall into maybe that side of the spectrum. And then you have the more conservative, uh, and they're all Democrats, effectively, sure. right? Because uh, we're a democratic town. We're a one, we are a one newspaper town and we're a, we're a one party town. And there's a lot of consequences to that, right? Which means there's not a lot of accountability. But if you want to uh, have a political career that starts in Portland, you have to be a Democrat. The spectrum from the center left and the far left. Exactly. So, you know, Justin Costa and Mark Dion are basically two versions of the same brand, which is I'm a conservative Democrat. And, you know, I'm going to watch the pocketbook and I'm going to make sure that, you know, uh, when I have to say no to, you know, fiscal uh, imprudence, I will put my foot down. And supposedly their message is, you know, Mr. Zaro and Mr. Ali won't do that. But the fact is, on both sides, um, you know, these are versions of the same story. Um, you know, I think I cover both bases. And, you know, I think Pius has had, you know, he's had, he's in the seventh year of his city council uh, tenure as an at-large counselor. So effectively, he's, he's the same voting base that puts the mayor in is, is the voting base that's put him in. But he's never really had a real opponent. And I don't think, uh, even though he's had that kind of glorified uh, lack of opposition, I don't think he's done much with it. Um, and I think Andrew as well, I mean, Andrew talks a lot about land use reform, but like on things like the Munjoy Hill Historic District, he waffled about maybe this not being a good idea, but he ended up voting the same way Mark Dion did, which is kind of funny because Mark Dion and, and Andrew Zaro, both of their votes were critical to getting the Munjoy Hill Historic District across the goal line. Neither of them uh, represent Munjoy Hill, right? Their districts are somewhere else, but it was a very potent symbol of, we're gonna protect our neighborhoods in District 4 and 5 from any kind of development pressure. We're going to make sure it happens somewhere else. Um, and so they had a very hard time saying no to that because it looked very similar to what their constituents probably want from them in their districts. But so we basically ending up in the same place. We're not making progress. I mean, Andrew had thought that he had negotiated for this like elaborate in-depth study of historic preservation impacts across the city. And that was a very nebulous effort to begin with. But that study still remains undelivered. We haven't even seen it. There has been controversy about it, but that controversy just kind of kept pushing it. Staff now has, has had no incentive whatsoever to even see it, have it see the light of day, right? Because nobody wants to touch that that hot button issue. But the thing is, I believe- and It's done. The, 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 the district is in, in Wisconsin. Sure, and with every passing year, it's gonna be harder and harder to ever, ever change the contours of that. And that's what happens to our city year after year is certain things get baked in and it's a straight jacket. And we don't get that kind of flexibility that a growing city needs. You know, we didn't have zoning in Portland until 1926. And it was an elite project, uh, the John Calvin Stevens and his allies, the same allies that put us 
uh, that gave us the city manager system, right. this was one of their first initiatives. The very first thing that they wanted to do was to institute zoning. And well, it, this was pro progressive politics. This was seen as uh, taking things out of the, uh, the, the scrum of, uh, of the market and, and using professional management. And, and well, I mean, it, you know, progressive politics was, I mean, the prohibition was all linked up in this too. Sure. And it was like, you it's know. Also a progressive. Uh, like, yeah, but progressive, the progressive, uh, you know, impulse in America was largely an elite effort. And, and it had elite interests first and foremost. And zoning first and foremost had, uh, you know, this new crazy automobile is causing noise and, and you know, somebody might build a, a commercial garage near me. Um, it's all these immigrants are packing into, you know, the, my neighbor's homes. Um, I'm worried about these landlords that might be, you know, trying to change my neighborhood without my consent. Um, and so I want protection. And, you know, the, the irony is that those pre-zoning neighborhoods are the most desirable in the city. Exactly, because they've been frozen in amber. But the thing about zoning in 1926, yeah, scarcity. <laughs> when it when it went, it had to go to referendum and it passed by 30 votes. It's probably the closest vote on any major issue that the city has ever engaged in. 30 votes. And then it got thrown out by the Maine Supreme Court in the 1930s. And they had to do another referendum. And in the height of the Great Depression, Guess how many votes it passed? It was overwhelmingly re-ratified because at that point, every homeowner in Portland that hadn't been foreclosed on or lost their house or had their mortgage renegotiated by the New Deal, which was a big part of the New Deal, every single person suddenly had a real deep interest in making sure that their nest egg, their home, was protected from change and from anything happening around them. And that's the system that we have today, which is, you know, uh, you used to buy real estate or a home as an inflation hedge. You were just, hopefully your home would appreciate and your mortgage, you know, uh, obligations would stay just a bit ahead of inflation. But then when we had OPEC and the oil crisis, suddenly real estate and like high interest rates sort of upset that apple cart. And there was a tremendous fear that we weren't able to, um, you know, the value of my home is dropping. You know, I'm spending all this time going to work to pay my mortgage and my house is worth less today than it was when I bought it three years ago. Like, oh my God, that's not a, that's an upside down system. So people became even more hyper invested in making sure that nothing in their neighborhoods changed. But the consequence of that is when your city doesn't change, you don't have a real city, right? You have a city that is not responding to what's happening around it. And, you know, between the census in, in 2010 and 2020, the national census, there was like 30 mains, the, the amount of population growth across the country, it was like 30 mains worth, right? Yeah. Why did Maine see a tiny fraction of that population growth? It's because Maine sort of institutionally and legally through zoning and through other uh, state mandated uh, anti-growth policies basically can't even when we want to welcome people in it's incredibly hard to figure out a place for them and so it's no surprise i mean i don't want blood money i mean i've seen tremendous appreciation in my home since i bought it in 2015 but i figure i feel like pretty guilty to some extent about that appreciation you know i mean it it is you know it, it might offend some people to call it blood money but the human misery that that it's a great investment, but it has a consequence, which means that a lot of people are shutting out, are being shut out. And if you want to do something about climate change, if we, I mean, in 2000, there was a report by the state planning office before, this was before LePage eliminated it, but it basically talked about how Southern Maine and other parts of Maine that are urbanizing and that uh, have seen development are pretty much the most sprawling parts of America. That the sprawl that we see and because we have a lot of trees in Maine, it's sometimes kind of hidden. But our sprawl is as bad as Los Angeles. It is bad as the as the Sun Belt, as bad as Florida. It is terrible land use. It is exactly why we have climate change. But we are so invested in that in Maine because of, we've been working on this, creating this geography and this landscape for so long that basically we're just doubling down on it, you know. And so, in every time we've refused to build in Portland. We are basically saying the development should happen somewhere else down the road. And that is basically, you know, I don't care how many solar panels you have on your public buildings, 
if you're creating five, 10,000 cars a year in, in, in the hinter regions of Cumberland County, you're not doing anything about climate change. In fact, our one climate future report that came out that you know, was worked on by a lot of people and was presented with much fanfare, that doesn't even acknowledge in that report all of the people that come up for day trips and for tourist trips and you know all the, the back and forth between the rest of New England and you know the I-95 corridor that comes up into Maine. That's our that's our, our artery, right? Without that, we're dead. But that all of that, we decided to just ignore that. We just completely said, well, those aren't our cars. We can't control them, so we don't have to count them in our calculation of what we're going to do about our climate budget, our climate impacts, our climate mitigation effects. So it's a little bit crazy because, you know, I don't know how you do, I, mean, I don't know how some of these city councilor or other candidates are talking about climate change when you basically have eliminated most of the generating of the climate change that our city does as a, as a, as a right. regional economy and as a, a local economy. You know, I think we need to be honest, and there's no magic wand here. Our population triples every day, right? Like, uh, we're 67,000 people. Absolutely, and we have these giant car sewers that run through our downtown, yeah. which isn't healthy for our downtown, and it's unsafe, but those are critical. I mean, if Cape Elizabeth and the people who have nice, expensive single-family homes can't easily get to their jobs in Falmouth, <laughs> you know, by driving through Portland, you know, and this is one reason why John Jennings a few years ago, there was a, the idea to, to um, reverse the one ways on high and state and make them two way yeah. streets again, like they were many, you know, fairly recently, actually, um, like within our lifetimes, they uh, basically, he didn't want to fight that battle. And so he did as a staff, again, as a city manager can do, he got it off the agenda and he pushed it off everyone's radar and the city council had no, even if they wanted it back on the agenda, they had, they were flummoxed. Mm -hmm. And to me, if you care about trying to improve basic things like our traffic landscape, you have to fight literally in the trenches every day to make sure that if you want that back on the agenda, you have to prepare. It may not happen right away. It may be, I mean, a four year term can go fast. It can probably feel pretty slow too, as I'm sure a current <laughs> mayor may feel, but you have to be able to um, anticipate where I can slot this in. And you do that by constantly recalibrating literally every day about where are we at, what can we accomplish, what do people want, what do people need, because I want my fellow counselors to look good. I have no, you know, this, this, uh... no incentive to like be like my ideas or the highway because you're right. It will slow things down. At some point, there will be some kind of conflict butting of the heads. And if that opens and it comes out in open warfare like it did with Ethan Strimling and his mm -hmm. fellow council members, everyone just, it's just you take hard positions and you buckle down. I mean, Justin Costa was one of the major uh, consigliaries of taking down Ethan Strimling. And so I think it's ironic that he's talking on the campaign trail about being a conciliator and being a collaborator and all of that. I'm like, you know, you're, you have a very progressive city council right now, Justin. You're gonna, if you get elected, you're walking into an environment where none of those people are really all that mindful of listening to you. And they're, all they have to do is take a page from your city council career, which is isolate the mayor, cut them out, yeah. take them down, you know, push them into a corner, shut them up. And he's, he's given them that roadmap. Because that's what he did. He literally, he and Belinda Ray and Spencer Thibodeau and the other folks at that in that era, that's their job. That was their job. They were tasked by the city manager to basically do his dirty work out in the council arena while he was working hard behind the scenes to undercut. And if that's the dynamic uh, that you've already laid out, I don't know how you get, how you, you know, basically make a case to the citizens of Portland. Like I helped undercut a mayor and I will be. There was, it was eight to one all the time. Well, but, but that's the thing. I, I don't know that, you know, uh, I mean, it would be great to get some of the other counselors to weigh in. We'll see what the, yeah. if the endorsements shake out in the next few weeks, but you know, he has a big hill to climb, I think, to be taken seriously. And so this has been really interesting. And, um, uh, I had a lot of other questions, so uh, maybe some other time we can we can get a cup of coffee or something. So, um, you've been watching this very closely, but um, you know, ultimately, the 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 where we end up with each of the candidates um, is um, the ultimate question: uh, 
why should people vote for you and why are you running? Yep. Well, again, um, and, you know, there's a lot of city business to absorb. I've absorbed a lot of it. Um, I'm going to be able to hit the ground running. I know a lot of the players. I know the ground that's been covered. Um, and I'm learning all the time, so I'm, I'm, I don't know everything. But uh, I want to be here from, I want our new mayor to be starting with, from a, um, a position of knowledge and understanding and also be taken seriously from day one. I mean, the staff knows that I'm to be reckoned with. And I don't want, I want respect. I don't want fear. I want respect. And they will know that, you know, He's got, we're going to have to listen to this guy. And so I don't want, uh, I want my counsel that I'm going to be sharing, you know, uh, the, the room with to feel like they have an ally and that I don't have, I haven't taken positions in any camps that make it impossible for me to shuttle back and forth. And we've heard other candidates talking about shuttle diplomacy and whatnot. I mean, that's America, right? Like, you know, that's been America forever. They were shuttling back and forth in the Constitutional Convention, and that's how we ended up with a crazy constitutional <laughs> constitution. But the point is, is that is the essence of government, right? Is you're always shuttling them back and forth. And I believe that nobody has to take a chance on their candidate losing, um, you know, because if you go with me, you will get experience, you will get knowledge, and you will get an opportunity to be heard on both sides, on the progressive camp and on the more conservative, maybe a little bit more, you know, you can describe it in various ways, law, the law and order camp. I know that Mr. Dion has been really, you know, I'm going to take care of these camps. Um, but the reality is the district attorney, their office is also completely under overwhelmed. I mean, the district attorney herself was taking cases in a courtroom, you know? I mean, that doesn't happen very often. She was literally just trying to keep the fire hose of cases that, that her office is dealing with because she too has staffing issues. She too has issues. So if somebody thinks we're gonna arrest our way out of this magically, like overnight, I mean, you know, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of pushback at the county level that says Portland, Deal with this in another way because you're not going to flood our jails and you're not going to flood our courts. Um, and if you do, you're going to probably break the whole system. And that's completely irresponsible. So this idea, this hope to everyone in Portland that's been impacted by this. I mean, I've been dealing with this for eight years. I clean up human excrement off of my foundation a couple of times a week because I, you know, it, it is what you have to do. I mean, you just have to keep going. But the fact is, like, it is, there's no easy answers here when you've created a decades long backlog of good choices that haven't gotten done. And again, other people are saying the same thing too. I mean, I'm not like, you know, I'm not come down from the clouds with the only one that, that sees this, but as the whole nation is dealing with this, but we have to really make good choices about how we focus our attention. And, but we, we don't have, I mean, a lot of the counselors, the, the, the newest counselors, they will acknowledge, and you often see them in some of their committees, basically saying, look, I, I'm learning a ton. I had no idea. And no one writes on their little palm card for the election season, I will take 18 to 24 months to figure out what I'm doing, right. you know? And, but that's basically what they're acknowledging and admitting and behind the scenes or even in open and openly in public. I mean, I love... Dylan Pugh seems like a tremendous like neighbor and citizen. Like I'm glad he's getting involved, but you know I don't think that he has a handle on the the minutia and the fire hose of information that's going to hit him on day one. And you know if voters want to trust his you know his uh, aspirations uh, with their vote, great, do it. But recognize that you're probably going to get someone who is immediately pancaked by the reality. You know, I mean, we've been watching buses go by during this. Yeah. You know, if he's going to get hit by a bus and it's going to take him a while to get back up. And before you know it, it there's going to be a lot of angry people saying, why is City Hall even more paralyzed after Dylan than before Dylan, right? And I want to avoid the paralysis. And we have to make choices uh, very deliberately, very carefully based on a lot of information all in front of us. And that is the Monday through Friday job. And you need somebody with skills. I'm a transactional attorney. 
I'm not licensed in Maine. I've never wanted to have clients or, or, or anybody in Maine that I've, uh, but you know, I'm licensed in California and New York. And my experience is about deal-making, right? And deal-making, no deal gets hap happens. In fact, the first law firm I worked for in New York City, we only got paid if the deal got done. And so if the deal doesn't get done, that's my failure, right? I could not figure out a way to help my client and help the other side understand that, do you guys want to do something here? Because you're going to have to figure out something has to change. Because if you have all of the leverage, you can sometimes just steamroll past somebody, right? But if you think that you're, um, uh, that there's some parity, then you can be like, okay, well, what's reasonable? What can we, what, what are the goals? What can we give each other that helps us move on? And I am not, you know, uh, saying that my legal skills, I mean, a lot of people are good at this. You don't have to be a lawyer to do that. But I do think that I have some real experience and that's what we have to do is like, get the information in front of us. Where can we move? Where can we give? Where can we um, s stick to our guns? Because no politician wants to look like they're giving up uh, something important, but often it's rhetoric. It's often testing out and educate public education. So it's a multi, -pro you know, multi pronged process. So you have to be firing on a lot of cylinders to do this well. But the idea that you know this is easy, or that somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience doing this, or somebody even that has been a counselor in a very part time, isolated manner, is going to be successful at that. You know, I mean, it's a leap of faith, right? And that's every voter is going to be engaging in a leap, leap of faith of some kind between now and uh, the when the polls close. I want them to. A voter uh, wants to make a leap of faith deal. What do they do? They so it's it's uh, I as a writing candidate because there are no other writing candidates. You will write my name in and put this money in correctly. No, the voter intent is liberally applied in the state of Maine under the Secretary of State and the, the state law. So as long as it doesn't look like another candidate and it's not confusing, they don't. They could spell my name is pronounced like R O W, but it's spelled R H E A U L T. Um, but if you wrote R O W or R O W E, if you wrote George, if you wrote um, you know something that is at least distinguishable uh, in terms of of understanding. G O R, you know, that probably has to be accepted by the city clerk. The next thing is you have to fill in an oval, as you do with the named ballot, and you have to rank me. So, you know, again, I get because there's no other writing candidates, I get the benefit if you do put my name down and write my name in in a way that's that's cognizable by the city clerk uh, when they're counting the ballots, you will get to um Rank me as long as you know. I could be the first choice. I could be the second choice. I could be the last choice. Or I could be just you know. Won't, I won't show up at all. But I think that I add a lot, and I wanted to make sure that voters had another choice and a choice of experience and understanding and knowledge. And I was very concerned that our city in the next four years has to do some really hard things and some really important things, and we don't have four years to to fumble that and to wait for the next mayoral election, right? So, or wait for someone to resign in frustration because they're not making any headway. So that's where I'd like to be, is you will, um, uh, you'll take a chance on me. It's a little extra work, but you will get to a better place in our city by voting for me. And uh, these other gentlemen are excellent folks and I want to keep them in the loop, but I think that we have more to gain, obviously, from me, so. All right. Well, let's leave it at that. And uh, thank you so much for coming in and good luck. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the effort and uh, uh, including me. So okay. thanks.